Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the two or four player Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances, designed by Sean Fletcher and published by The Op, who helps sponsor this video. As a powerful summoner here, you'll be gathering heroes and villains from the Disney and Pixar universe to go up against your opponents in a contest of magic, muscle, and wits. The rulebook introduces how to play over a series of teaching games, adding a few new rules to each session. But here, I'm gonna teach you everything you need to know all at once. There are also rules for team play that we'll quickly discuss at the end, but to begin, we'll assume we have just two players. So with that understood, join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, place the game board in the center of the play area with each opponent seated on either of these sides. Also set these status and victory point tokens nearby. Mine are in a game tray that I have, and if you'd like some of your own, you'll find links in the description. There are also various status effect tiles, and you arrange them nearby with matching tiles stacked on top of each other. Now collect the eight character ability cards that come in the game. These are double-sided, and they should begin the game with the side face up that says upgrade in this area here. The players are known as summoners, and each summoner will control three of these characters. The box we have comes with eight, but more can be picked up separately. And while you can just have players pick the three characters they want to use, you may prefer to draft them. To do this, pick one of the players to go first, and this could be the player who most recently watched a Disney movie, or who lost the last game you played, or you could just pick someone randomly. Either way, that player will be known as Summoner A, and the other becomes Summoner B. Now using this chart in the rule book that we see on screen, have Summoner A look through all of the characters and pick one for their team. Then Summoner B goes through and picks two of the remaining ones for their team, and then Summoner A picks two more characters, and finally Summoner B takes one more. Any leftover characters are then returned to the box. Over the course of this video, you'll learn why you might want one character over another, but you don't have to worry about that right now. The important thing is that each summoner has three characters. The ones you control are known as your allies, and any your opponent controls are known as rivals. Each character in the game comes with a standee and a base, and these will have a plastic film on them that should be removed for your first game. Then assemble them by fitting the standee into the slot of its base. And you can refer to this page of the rules to ensure that you have the right bases paired with the right characters. Once that's done, players collect the figures that match the characters they drafted, returning any extra standees back to the box. Each player now picks a color, red or blue, and takes the matching rings, which they'll add to their three characters, ensuring that the arrows on them are pointing to the highest value printed on their bases. Your standee should look something like this when you're done. And now, for each of your characters, find the matching turn order tile. This will show their face in the center, but flip it to the side that matches the color of your character's ring here at the bottom. Each player now secretly stacks their three turn order tiles in the order that they want their characters to take turns during the game. For example, if I wanted Sorcerer's Apprentice Mickey to go first and Ariel last, I would stack them like this, again, keeping my choices a secret. When the players are both ready, they reveal their stacks to each other and then check the initiative values showing on the top characters, which are the numbers here. And the player showing the lowest value will place their turn tiles first. Now each of the characters in this set have different values, so you're never going to have a tie. But if you had two copies of the game and one of the players was using the same characters as another, you could have a tie in that case. And then you would compare the values of your second characters. If those were tied as well, compare the third characters. And if there's still a tie, just pick one of the players randomly. This person now sets their tiles in a column, matching the order that they were stacked in from top to bottom, and turned to face their side of the board with a space between each one. Then the other player does the same thing with their tiles, setting them in the spaces between their opponents, but rotated to face their own side of the table setting their top tile under their opponent's top tile, their second tile under their opponent's second tile, and then their last one they set here at the bottom. To the turn tile that was placed first, Sorcerer's Apprentice Mickey in our case, you then add this turn marker. Now set your character ability cards in front of you and collect 
each of your character's deaths. You can identify these because they'll have their name and their picture here in the top left-hand corner. You now take each of the three decks, combine them, and then shuffle them into a single face-down deck that you'll place in front of you. Each character shows a hand size value in this area of their ability card, and you now add these numbers together. This total is how many cards you draw from your deck as an opening hand. You can always examine your own cards, but keep them a secret from the other players. Now each player adds their character standees to any three of the light blue spaces on their side of the board, but no more than one character can ever share the same space. Lastly, each player takes one of these chapter three and four player references. The other player reference is only used when you're playing the beginner version of the game, so we won't need this one. And that's the setup. In Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances, players will be battling in an arena to claim spaces and knock out rivals in order to earn victory points. Earn the most by the end of the game, and you win. The game is played over a series of rounds, and in each round, every character will get to take a single turn. The character with this marker on their turn order tile is the active character and takes the first turn following all of the steps showing on the player reference. Then the marker will move to the next character who will take their turn, and so on until every character has gone. Then the round ends and a new one begins. Now, when a character is active, their summoner will be the one to perform all the steps of that turn. So let's see how a turn works. At the beginning of the game, you won't have any of these status tiles attached to your character, but we'll see how these get added later. For now, we'll just assume it's later in the game and that we do have some attached, because at the very start of the active character's turn, you go through any status tiles beside it and remove one of these status tokens from each of those tiles, returning them to the supply. And if doing this ever removes the last token from a status tile, you return the tile to the supply as well, and then close in any gaps. As we'll see later, status effects can give benefits or penalties to your characters. And once they no longer have any tokens on them, they go away and their effects stop. The next step of your turn is to check if your active character is standing on one of these special golden victory point spaces, which might happen later in the game. And if so, you now collect one victory point from the supply and put it in front of you on the table. These points will help you win the game, as we'll see. You'll find a reminder of these first steps of a turn right here at the top of your player reference. But now let's move to the next step, returning KO'd characters to the arena. During the game, as your characters battle, they may be knocked out, also known as being KO'd. And when that happens, they're taken from the board and set beside you. Now, if the character taking its turn is still on the board, as it would be at the beginning of the game, you just skip this step. But let's pretend it's later in the game and it has been knocked out. As we'll see, a model gets knocked out when its tracker reaches zero, which represents its current health. So during this step, the very first thing you do is restore the characters back to full health. Once this is done, you then place the model on any empty blue space showing this symbol. This means you could also place it into the spaces that were originally on your opponent's side of the board. If you had a situation where there were no empty back row spaces on either side, which could really only happen in a team game since it uses more characters, you would instead place your model on any unoccupied space closest to a back row. Continuing with your turn, now we come to the draw one card step, where as you might have guessed, you draw one card from the top of your deck and add it to your hand. If you ever need to draw a card and there isn't one in your deck, well, you don't get to draw anything, and that's one of the ways that the end of the game can be triggered, as we'll see later. Okay, so those are all of the steps that make up what is known as the starting phase of a turn. Now we move on to the main phase where you can move, perform one action, and activate any number of skills you may have. And you can do all of that in any order or skip any of those options if you like. But let's start by seeing how moving works. There are two different ways you can move as shown in this bulleted list, but you can only pick just one. So let's learn this standard move first. Here you check the standard move value of the active character as shown in this area of their character ability card. For Sorcerer's Apprentice Mickey, it's two spaces. However, before moving, as it says here, you may first discard any one movement card from your hand to add one to your standard move value for this turn. The cards you have in your hand are divided into two main types. 
movement cards, which have this symbol, and action cards, which have this symbol. This will remind you of what phases they can be played in, either the movement or action phase. Now, some will show a combination of both symbols, meaning they can be played in either phase. So as I was saying, before moving, you can discard any card showing the movement symbol, like this one or this one, in order to add one to your move value this turn. Now while we're here, notice this area, which shows the character this card belongs to. Even though I'm about to move Mickey, I can discard a movement card that belongs to any character in my hand to gain this bonus movement point. But at most, I can only discard one, and let's say I do. Anything you discard goes into a personal face-up discard pile, and as you discard more cards over the course of the game, you may find it useful to offset them so you can see the symbols showing in their bottom corner, which will be important later. So we know that Mickey's standard move value is 2, and if we want to discard a movement card first, we can increase it to 3. Your final value is the number of spaces you may move up to going from one adjacent space to another. You can always go through spaces with allies, but not spaces with rivals, and must always end your move on an empty space. Now rather than doing a standard move during this phase, you may instead choose to play one movement card from your hand. Again, this will be a card showing either of these two symbols. However, this card must show the active character symbol here. So we couldn't play this card during Mickey's turn, but we could play this one. You then resolve the effects printed on the card here in order from top to bottom. So first, we would move Mickey up to three spaces, and then we're told to return to our hand up to one card from our discard pile that shows this symbol on it. This is known as a card type symbol, and these will only be found on certain cards, but there are three possible symbols you might see, and you'll always find them in this area. The sword is an attack symbol, the swirl represents magic, and these arrows are known as a status symbol. So when playing Quick Recall, it says to return up to one card from your discard pile, which you would now go through, that shows the magic symbol, and you put this back into your hand. There are many different effects you'll encounter on the cards you play, and we'll look at more examples soon so you can feel confident about how to resolve them when playing. But either way, after resolving the effects on a movement card, you then place it into your discard pile. And with that, we've now explained the movement phase. Again, you can either take a standard move, which allows you to discard one movement card from your hand to increase the distance by one, if you want, or you can play one of the active player's movement cards in order to resolve its listed effects. Next though, let's learn how you resolve the action phase. As it shows here, you have two ways to resolve this part of your character's turn, but you can only pick one, so let's begin with this standard attack. First, check the active character's standard attack value shown here. For Mickey, it's two. They now apply that value as damage to any one adjacent rival character. I've set up an example here where Mickey is going to target Dr. Facilier. And when a character takes damage, you reduce their dial by that amount, rotating the ring on their base. This value represents the figure's health. If a character's health is ever reduced below one, it is immediately knocked out or KO'd. It is then removed from the board and set by its summoner. You also remove all status counters and tiles from beside its turn order tile. Now check the victory point value of the character that was knocked out, which is shown here. The rival summoner of the knocked out character now collects that number of victory point tokens from the supply. And that means if you somehow knocked out your own character, it's your rival who would get the points for it. As we discussed earlier, at the start of the KO'd character's next turn, it will be returned to the board at full health to any of the back row blue spaces on either side of the board. However, while it's off the board, it cannot be targeted by any effects unless a special ability says otherwise. Okay, so we were discussing the standard attack, but there's a way to boost it that we should also discuss. As it says here, before making a standard attack, you may choose to discard a single card from your hand showing this attack symbol in the area here. If you do, you boost your standard attack value by one until the end of the phase. And notice, the card you pick does not have to show the symbol of the active character. With that understood, now let's look at the other type of action you can perform during this phase, playing one active character action card. Action cards are any that show this action symbol here, or the action movement combination symbol. 
However, the card played must also show the active character's face in the corner, so we couldn't use this one during Mickey's turn. After playing an action card, you resolve it from top to bottom, so let's look at this one as an example. It first tells us that Sorcerer's Apprentice Mickey gains two Magic Broom. Magic Broom is a status effect, and we know this because it's in bold, it has the status effect card type here, and because we can find a status effect tile in the supply with the same name. When a character gains a status effect, you place the related tile beside its turn order tile, and then you add a number of status counters to it equal to the value showing on the effect. In this case, the number was two. While a status effect has counters on it, its effect is active. There are a variety of different status tiles, and these can have positive or negative effects. I have a few of them laid out here. For example, a character with the strong status adds one to any damage it deals, while a character that is immobilized cannot be moved. Now, we won't go through all the different status effects in this video, but just refer to the back of the rulebook to see how each of them works. Any that are blue are considered constant, ongoing effects, while any that are orange are only triggered at certain times. For example, Flustered here says that any time a status counter is removed from this tile during the starting phase, that character's summoner must banish a card from their hand. To banish a card, you pick any one that you're holding and remove it from the game. If a character already has a status and then gains more of it, let's say that Mickey played this card later, which says that after moving two spaces, he gains two Magic Broom. Well, the Magic Broom status is already in play on his character, so now we just add the related number of status counters to any it has already, so one, two more. A character can have more than one status at a time, and any new ones that are added are just placed adjacent to any that it already has. If more than one status effect would ever trigger on a character at the same time, that character's summoner decides which order to resolve them in. As mentioned earlier, at the start of a character's turn, one status counter is removed from each of its status tiles. And once a tile has no more counters on it, that tile is returned to the supply and its effects go away. Now here's an interesting ability. It allows you to remove a status effect entirely. In a case like that, you just return any counters on it to the supply, along with the tile itself. With that, you now know how to play and resolve an action card, and once it's resolved, you then add it to your discard pile. Now, there are several of these action cards in the game, and we're not going to go through each of them, but if I give you a few examples, it should help you be able to resolve any other ones you come across while playing. This effect says to deal one damage to each rival, and if you would ever deal damage to more than one character at a time, like you could here, the player who controls the source of the damage, Mickey in this case, chooses the order in which those characters take the damage. Before moving on, I want to point out a couple of symbols you might see sitting in front of certain effects. For example, this one here indicates that the ability is an indirect effect. But when you see this symbol, it means you're looking at a direct effect. A direct effect is anywhere you, as the summoner, must choose one or more characters to target, whereas an indirect effect will tell you what category of character you must target. For example, the category of target in this case is each rival. So as a player, you don't get to choose the target. The card has chosen for you. You must damage each rival. So that makes it an indirect effect. While in this case, the target is listed as an adjacent rival. So as the player, you can pick any adjacent rival. So again, a direct effect is one where you pick the target. An indirect effect is one where the card picks the target. If a card's effect is a direct one, then you must have a valid target in order to play that card. Here, Gaston deals damage to an adjacent rival, but if no rivals are adjacent to his standee, then this card cannot be played. Now that said, you may not be able to resolve a later effect because an earlier one made it impossible, and that's okay. So for example, we could play this card to deal three damage to an adjacent rival, and if that defeated the rival, we would not be able to resolve this second effect, which would try to move it because that rival is no longer on the board. But that's okay, we can still play this card even though we can't resolve the second effect. You can never choose to ignore the instructions printed on a card, but any you can't fully complete, like we just saw in this case, you resolve just as much as you can. Some effects will refer to a range. This means it targets a space up to that number of adjacent spaces away. For example, at a range of two, Ariel here could target this figure, which is one, two spaces away. 
Some effects may tell you to reveal a card. In this case, the top one of this summoner's deck. All summoners may look at the revealed card, and once everyone has seen it, you then return it to wherever it was revealed from. Some effects will cause a summoner to lose victory points, which are represented by this symbol. When this happens, the player just returns those tokens back to the supply. But note, you can never have less than zero victory points. So if you'd ever need to lose more than you have, you just ignore losing any extras. Okay, with that, we've covered how to play an action card and the action phase itself. So now let's look at the skills phase. Here, you can resolve any number of the skills available to the active character once each in any order. Here we have Aladdin, and a character's skills are listed in this area. This one requires the summoner to discard a movement card to activate it, and it can be anyone they're holding. It doesn't have to show Aladdin on it specifically. I should also mention that although your character may have more than one skill, like Aladdin does, you only have one skills phase. In other words, you can't resolve one skill, then do a move action, and then use another skill after. In the same way, you can't do a partial move, stop, do an action, and then keep moving after. You have a movement phase, an action phase, and a skills phase. And you can do them in any order, but you can't break them up. And with that understood, it's now time to talk about gears. As I had mentioned, every time you play a card, it goes to your discard pile after, and I had recommended that you offset the cards there so you can see the symbol showing in its bottom right-hand corner. These are known as gears, and there are four different types. Fire, Shell, Heart, and Wind. As soon as a card goes into your discard pile, you're said to have collected the gear it shows. In a case like this, if we had these in our discard pile, it would mean that I have two shell, two wind, and one fire gear. So let's see how these are used. Every character has an upgrade cost in gears here, and as soon as you've collected the matching gears in your discard pile, you can upgrade your character. And this can happen at any point between any of the phases of that character's turn. To do it, you banish the cards showing the required cost, which again means we would remove them from the game. You then flip your character card over to its upgraded side, and this will reveal a new ability in the area here. This will describe both how it works and when it can be used. Once a character has been upgraded, it will stay upgraded, even if it gets knocked out. The only thing that would cause it to flip back over is if some effect instructed it to. Each character deck will have a different distribution of gears it contains, and these are summarized here. Mickey, for example, only has one card showing the shell symbol, but he needs two of them in order to upgrade. So when you're drafting characters at the beginning of the game, you might want ones that make it easier to upgrade your other characters. In a case where I have Mickey, I might want a character who also provides several shells. While we're on the topic of cards, I should also point out that the number of bars found at the top of each one here informs you of how many copies of that card you have in your deck. For example, we see three bars here, so there are three copies of Shooting Star. All right, with that understood, let's go back to a character's turn. After they've completed any movement, action, or skill phases they wish to perform, they now discard down to their maximum hand limit. Your hand limit is the total of the hand size values on your three characters, so in this case, we would have to discard some if we were holding more than six. And that brings us to the end of a character's turn, at which point you move the turn order marker down, and then that character becomes the active one and takes their turn. And turns will continue until you get to the end of the last character's turn in this column, and at that point, you check to see if the game is over. If during that round, any player had needed to draw a card but their deck was empty, the game now ends. Or if any player scored their 20th victory point during this round, the game will now also end. Just keep in mind the game doesn't end as soon as one of those things happens. You still finish the current round so that every character will have had an even number of turns. At that point, if the end of the game was triggered, you now check to see which summoner has the most victory points and you declare them the winner. If there's a tie, you continue playing rounds until one ends with one summoner having more points than the other, making them the winner. On the other hand, if you get to the end of a round and the end of the game hasn't been triggered, you start a new round by moving the turn order marker to the character at the top of the turn order column, and then you continue taking turns. And that's how you play a game between two opponents.
The game also comes with rules for team play, where two players will work together facing off against a team of two other players. And here, each player will control two characters, making a total of four characters per team. But I'll leave these rules for you to discover on your own. Otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances. If you have any questions at all about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over at the games page on BoardGameGeek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.